welcome to Docupied, a podcast about anime, manga, light novels, and industry news. I'm your host, Brandon, otherwise known as DocPay, and let's jump right into the news roundup for this episode. Continuing the ongoing segment of updates for delays, these next few delays hit pretty hard. I was really looking forward to these at some point this year, but it was not to be. Log Horizon's third season was delayed to January 2021, and Thunderbolt Fantasy's third season was also delayed to 2021. Studio Bones' upcoming anime film, Josie, the Tiger, and the Fish, has been delayed. This film looked pretty interesting. It has quite a bit of staff on it that I recognize, and it looked quite promising. But it's been pushed back. And we have one additional show that's been put back on the schedule. The Millionaire Detective will resume on July 30th. So expectedly, lots and lots of things continue to be impacted. Speaking of things that were impacted, uh, Oticon announced an online event that will be held on August 1st to include interviews, panels, etc. It seems like they'll be doing a one-day live stream since they're unable to host the event physically. A couple other conventions have announced similar things. I know Anime Expo is doing an Anime Expo Lite. Funimation is holding Funimation Con. There was Cloud Matsudi a couple weeks ago. And I think there's a couple others. I don't know all of them, but if they're going to be available for free for streaming in the US, I'll probably give most of them a quick look, see what's on their schedule, what kind of guests they'll be interviewing. But since they'll be streaming free online, there's no reason not to take a look and give it a shot and see what it's about. I'm always up for more industry content. Moving on, the Promised Neverland manga series just published its final chapter, so that series is now over. They'll be publishing art books and fan books and additional stuff, but it's done. It's been in the final arc for a little while, quite clearly heading for its conclusion, so this was not like it was cancelled or anything, the story just finished. But hopefully that means future anime seasons will be able to adapt the entirety of the story, because it has a hard finish ending now. Speaking of continuations, one of my absolute favorite anime series ever, which is based on a novel from one of my favorite Japanese authors, The Tatami Galaxy by Tomihiko Morimi, is getting a sequel novel called Tatami Time Machine Blues. The premise for this novel sounds pretty hilarious, and apparently it's based on a stage play by Morimi's friend, Makoto Ueda. The stage play's name is Summertime Machine Blues, and the premise sounds wonderfully perfect for Morimi's style of writing and storytelling. And I absolutely hope this means one day we'll get an anime adaptation of this novel. Or a film, I'd love to see it animated one day. And especially by much of the same team that did Tatami Galaxy originally, Masaki Yuasa, and maybe they can take it up at Science Saru. That'd be really cool. I'd also really love to get Tatami Galaxy I'd also really love to see Tatami Galaxy and Eccentric Family both licensed and published in English. And I'm hopeful, since we've gotten two of Morimi's novels published in English so far, that hopefully they're considering doing more. Next, we have a couple new manga license announcements. Kodansha had a live stream where they announced a few new series. Star Crossed by Junko. The Summer of You by... Furia Nagisa, Chasing After Aoi Koshiba by Hazuki Takeoka, Cells at Work Baby by Yasuhiro Fukuda, and Vertical in that same announcement has also picked up a couple new licenses. Haru's Curse by Asuka Konishi, and A School Frozen in Time by Naoshi Arakawa, based on a novel by Mizuki Tsujimura. You might recognize some of those names. They have other series that are a bit more famous or well-known or just already being published in English. But it looks like a pretty interesting lineup of new series. That's going to wrap up the news section for this episode. So here's your general spoiler warning for the following recommendations. As usual, 
I will not be talking about specific plot points or character development that would spoil the story for anyone, but I will be talking generally about the characters and story and my thoughts on them. So there's your warning. The first series I'm going to talk about is a light novel by the name of Welcome to Japan, Ms. Elf by Makishima Suzuki. So this is somewhat less of a recommendation and more just a discussion because I was reading it, but I wouldn't talk about it if I didn't at least like it. The series is published by J Novel Club. There are three volumes currently out. The fourth volume will be released on June 21st, and this is all digital. And since I'm a member, I actually read volume four on the site, the pre-pub version already. So I'm going to talk about volumes one through four overall but again i'm not going to spoil anything specific so like i said this is less like a full-throated recommendation for this series than it is more of a review overview discussion kind of thing because while i do like this series and i enjoy reading it there's definitely some grains of salt to take with that this series is a little unique and it's kind of why i wanted to talk about it on the show as well It is not an isekai in the traditional sense, but it has fantasy elements. The main premise or gimmick of the story is essentially that our main character, Kazuhiro, when he goes to sleep, he dreams of this fantasy world, and he gets to live out his life in this fantasy world as what he assumes is basically like a video game. And he's been able to do that since he was a kid. What he discovers in the story of the first volume is that that is indeed not him dreaming but somehow a real another world that when he does dream he kind of transports into and conversely when he goes to sleep or dies in the quote-unquote dream world he wakes back up in reality in our world in japan what shatters this illusion of it being a dream is that like the title pretty much directly says, one of what he thought was a character, but is just another person, uh, Marie or Maribel, ends up traveling back with him to Japan when he wakes up. He finds her there after an incident in the dream world. Essentially, they both die in the dream world and wake up in Japan because they were holding on to each other. And so he learns that he's able to bring people back and forth as long as they hold on to him while he goes to sleep. And so that's the the basic setup. What this means is that the story is kind of a half and half situation here. Half of the story is a slice of life about introducing Marie, or the elf character, to Japan. The other half is a action fantasy story in this like mystical world that he thought was a dream up until now. I can't really say that this story is either slice of life or action fantasy. It is pretty much split down the middle both. This transition can be somewhat jarring for people. I personally don't have any problems with it, and I was used to the flipping back and forth in the story, you know, within the first volume, so it didn't bother me at all. But essentially... Every day he goes to sleep in Japan, he wakes back up in the dream world. He has, then, a day in the dream world, goes to sleep there, wakes back up in Japan. And that's the flow of the story. Occasionally, they'll skip days in one or the other to continue a particularly important or interesting uh, plot thread. And especially if nothing of consequence happens in one or the other, they just skip ahead and be like, okay, we woke up again and we're back and it's the next day. So on premise alone, yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's unique. And the through line for both of these stories is that Marie and Kazuhiro, through this and through getting closer and through experiencing both worlds together, essentially a romance begins. And so there's kind of a through line of romance through both the slice of life half and the action fantasy half. I wouldn't say the story is particularly well written or the plots like amazing or anything like that i think it's quite standard fare light novel writing but i do think there's quite a bit of enjoyment to be had here and i've enjoyed the four volumes i've read so far 
they're easy reads. They have a fairly satisfying romance that's being built on between the two main characters that actually has some progression. The fantasy world stuff is pretty interesting. They've weaved in some good plot lines that I think work well. And I think the slice of life half might be where I find most of my problem with it. It's actually probably the half that I should like best because I do really like Slice of Life, but I find myself held back by the way that the story plays out in that Slice of Life. And this might just be my own personal hang-up as someone who lived in Japan. This Slice of Life half is very, very much reminiscent of a lot of the you know Japanese TV shows that are all about introducing a foreigner to this like wonderful, amazing Japanese culture and just having them wowed by it. You you see it on so many TV programs on like NHK where they're just like, here, take around the foreigner and, and watch them be amazed at all the amazing Japanese stuff. So there is really an element there of like, wow, Japan's so amazing. Wow, a foreigner could, you know, never know any of this stuff or it's somewhat st- Dimied by the fact that she is an elf from the fantasy world, and so it's not like they plucked someone from another country in our world and brought them to Japan and had them marvel at all the crazy, awesome Japanese cultural stuff. In this case, she really is totally unaware of anything that they have, because you go from you know medieval sword and board fantasy with magic to our world. In present day. If you can get past all that, there's plenty of cute moments of Marie just enjoying fun things like trying different foods and reading books and watching anime and going on a trip with Kazuhiro and riding in a car for the first time. Everything you might expect from someone who shows up in Japan from a fantasy world and goes, What the fuck's all this? I have a really hard time moving past that. And so the slice of life portions are always kind of cringy to me, especially as someone who has seen and experienced all those same, like, look at the ignorant foreigner, look at him be so amazed at our Japanese culture. And again, that's probably more of a personal hang up that people who haven't experienced that stuff probably won't recognize too much. And you'll probably more instead enjoy the you know, descriptions of Japanese culture that she's experiencing. And I think there's definitely some merit to that. It's given me a little bit of nostalgia for the time I lived in Japan. But again, it's it's too mixed for me. And so that's why I'm saying this is more of a discussion than just a full-on, like, recommendation. But I just wanted to make that kind of clear that's where I was coming from there. Like I said, the, the slice of life portion isn't bad by any means. I just have my own issues with the way it presents the story and Marie experiencing this different culture. And I think they generally can get away with it because she is definitely just from like another fantasy world. So the trope kind of sort of makes more sense in this case. But anyway, I won't hamper on that too much. The other half, the action fantasy half, is interesting. It's decent. They get into some fights. They work on leveling up. They discover this ancient labyrinth and they start exploring that in the third and fourth volume and so the third and fourth volume was all about like exploring the levels and floors in the labyrinth and it's very rpg like you know you have skills you have levels and largely this is why kazuhiro thought that it was all a dream and he was just dreaming this incredibly immersive game every night of his life but it really is basically set up like a game. But obviously it is not a game. Uh, They also introduce an arc dragon. She goes by the name of Ridra. I'm actually not sure how to pronounce that properly, but that's how I say it in my head. And she becomes a central figure in the story as well. Because the halves of the story are pretty disconnected from each other in terms of plot, and only the main characters go back and forth between them, each world has its own set of characters and plot threads. And so they flip back and forth, you know, with most chapters. And that's the general flow of the story, is 
one real world chapter, one fantasy world chapter. And like I said, the, the main characters and the romance thread through all of that. The main characters, Marie and Ridra, along with Kazuhiro, I'm not so certain they're like super well written as characters, but they definitely, as the volumes go on, seem to be given some additional agency and they're breaking out a little bit from their roles as purely the elf who gets shocked and wowed by everything in Japan and Kazuhiro who likes playing a game in his dreams. And they're they're definitely shifting out of that. There's a decent amount of character growth and development that goes on, and I think that really adds to the series. But I wouldn't say overall this is a very like complex or deep story. A lot of this seems like a excuse to write the fact that this cute elf gets to go to bed and hug the main character tight every night in both worlds. That really seems like what the gimmick kind of boils down to is an excuse for the characters to sleep in the same bed every night. And then, obviously, the romance that builds. Now, I'm not necessarily complaining about that fact. It's simply that it definitely feels like the gimmick was, what if we had a reason to describe this cute elf falling asleep in the main character's arms every single chapter in different ways? So that's, that's, kind, of, that's kind of it for Welcome to Japan, Ms. Elf, especially if I don't want to get into anything specific in the plot but I think it's an overall decent series. It's a light, easy read, and the premise or gimmick is unique to say the least. The main character is an adult. Kazuhiro is an adult. Actually, all the characters are adults, and that's one thing that I really appreciate about this series is that I don't have to read about high school kids anymore because no longer being near high school age has, (laughs) at least personally, put me off from so many of the series that feature young protagonists like that. I've read and watched many a story about youth and adolescence and growing up and all that, so it is actually really nice to find a story that isn't really dealing with all that. Anyway, that's Welcome to Japan, Ms. Elf by Makishima Suzuki, published by J Novel Club and available digitally. Next, I wanted to actually talk about a manga series. You already know what it is, because if you're listening, you probably saw the title, but this series is one that I really loved and thought was a hilarious comedy series. Haven't you heard Am Sakamoto by Nami Sano? The series is published in English by Seven Seas. There are four volumes, and it is a complete series. Coincidentally, is actually on sale right now digitally if you buy the bundle of all four volumes on whatever platform of your choice it looks like it's discounted i'd actually made the decision to talk about this series before i saw that but it confirmed for me that i definitely should talk about it now you're probably more likely to have watched the anime adaptation of this series it was fairly popular when it aired but i'm going to be talking about the manga the series is a comedy and From start to finish, it has one basic gag that it uses, I think, to generally great effect. There are occasionally some weaker uses for it. Some of the chapters aren't as strong as some of the others. But the basic premise of the series is that the main character, Sakamoto, is essentially, by all accounts, the perfect human. He does everything perfectly, flawlessly. He'll turn any situation around, he'll help you solve your problems, all while looking fancy and fly and being perfect. At all times, he is living his best life. And that's the story. All four volumes are essentially about this character, Sakamoto, living his best life and encouraging everyone around him to live their lives to the fullest. The joke is that a lot of characters throughout the story will either like try to do something to him or use him or or they'll just like play with him or he gets into random crazy hijinks and drags them along but it's always about Sakamoto he is the central pillar of the series and really the only one that anyone cares about at least as far as i'm concerned there are some side characters and friends that he develops as the story progresses and there's even a nemesis character 
But at various points of the story, there are several characters that are against him, but he always wins them all over because that's Sakamoto. I personally find this gag to be great. In the manga, in the four volumes that exist, I don't think it gets old. I think some of the chapters are a little weaker than others, but this series lasted just long enough that it never wore out its welcome. Sakamoto being absolutely perfect was always funny. One thing you're probably wondering, if you watched the anime, should you read the manga? My answer is going to be always yes, but objectively, the anime covers the entirety of the manga's story. It rearranged some chapters and shrunk and condensed some storylines, but functionally it is the entirety of the manga. However, I think what it changes and what makes the manga worth reading, especially if you watched the anime at some point, probably a couple years ago now, the timing of the jokes in the manga is a little different than the anime. The way that the jokes hit, the way that the story flows in the paneling, in the artwork, all of that changes the structure of some of the jokes, the way they're presented, and in general, I think it's better. I think the manga is funnier than the anime. I mean, that's the way the story was originally told, and the anime is an adaptation. And I think they did a good job, and I thought the anime was funny, and the opening song was fantastic, so I'm really glad that it exists. But I think the presentation of the manga, and by nature of being a manga, I think the jokes land incredibly well. I'm not saying that the manga improved on the anime, because that's it's not the order of that, but I think if you were have already watched the anime, and you were to read the manga, you will probably enjoy the jokes a little better. You may already know the punchlines, or slightly remember them, but I think you'll find that the jokes land a little differently in the manga. So like I said, it's kind of more of a personal thing, where I always recommend reading the manga, and I think the improvements or the differences between the different versions might not be enough, but on the other hand, it's only four volumes. It's really not that much. It's a very tight, succinct manga series. The story really never meanders, if there could be said to be a story, really. Each chapter is more like a vignette of Sakamoto doing something, or being involved in something. There is a loose connection with some of the characters. Between each chapter, some of the side characters have moments of character growth through Sakamoto helping them, and that's kind of a, a through line for the series. Sakamoto is an ever-unchanging constant of being perfect, and that's steady throughout the entire thing. And so the shifts that you can follow through the story are the people around him, who all grow to be better people, more understanding of themselves, that kind of thing. If the story could be said to have a main thesis, it's definitely live your life to the fullest and accept yourself for who you are. Those are kind of some of the main constant themes, and especially Sakamoto is always doing his best and living his best life. He's always about doing whatever it is and doing it to the fullest. There's some fascinating theories out there about who or what Sakamoto really is, and I think they're quite hilarious, actually. They throw out various hints throughout the story, or Sakamoto himself gives hints about various things throughout the story, and there's some visual cues that lead people to think something or the other, and I think all that's actually pretty funny. It's all just theories. None of that will ever get like proven or resolved, and I don't think it needs to. I think it's just fun. So if you finish the story and you're still wondering, like, what the fuck, who the fuck was Sakamoto, well, look up some of those funny, interesting theories online. Maybe you'd already thought about one of them, but there's actually some compelling stuff for them. So one other aspect of this that I wanted to talk about was the art. Sakamoto's manga series, I can't really say it has great artwork. I think the author has particular trouble with bodies and proportions sometimes, and it's not always the best artwork, but I think for the purposes of Sakamoto and the story and the gags, I think it works really well. 
And especially as the volumes progress, the way that the jokes land and the paneling and the structure of the flow of the the panels really improves over time. And you get a sense of the flow of things improving. Initially up front, maybe some of it was hard to follow. The first couple chapters and the first volume where things aren't necessarily as clear what's going on or how things are playing out. But as the story progresses, you can tell the author is getting more and more used to it, improving on the timing and the paneling. So I think that's pretty interesting to see, personally. And then there's also the art style, which I don't really have a problem with, but I'm personally pretty open to any art style, as long as it suits the story and the purpose. I'm willing to give something a shot, but characters are drawn or can be drawn quite ugly. And there's occasionally some like somewhat more realistic or realism style of artwork in it. And that can be, I guess, off-putting to readers who are more used to a manga style artwork. I hate to call manga style because that's not remotely a thing. But when I say it, you probably know what I mean, that like shown and jump kind of artwork. So while I wouldn't say Sakamoto has like amazing art, I think it suits the series really well. And Sakamoto, as always, is drawn impeccably. His gags are hilarious and the stunts he pulls off inhuman. Overall, it's hard to find a series at four volumes short like this that's complete that is as good as Sakamoto. And that's why I can't help but recommend it. It's a fantastic series, and basically had me laughing from start to finish. There may have also been a little crying, because while it is fully a comedy, Sakamoto knows how to bring out the tears and and the drama can hit pretty hard too. Or you're crying because you're laughing so hard. Or you're laughing so hard to cover up the crying. But hey, that's just Sakamoto. So there you have it, there's my manga recommendation. Haven't you heard? I'm Sakamoto by Nami Sano, published in English by Seven Seas at four volumes. Like I said, right now there is a digital sale going on, so if you're listening to this podcast episode in the present, it is on sale, the four volume bundle. And if you don't own them, definitely go read them. That's going to do me for this episode. Thanks for listening. Follow my Twitter, I am DocPay, for updates. And if you like the show, Please leave me a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'll catch you next time.